Thank you everybody for coming out so early in the semester. Uh, I'm Dan Slater. I'm the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies, or WCED, here at the International Institute. And uh, we wanted to sort of open the year with a, a welcome session in a way. Um, so Joseph Wong here from the University of Toronto, my co-author and I have just published this, uh, this new book, uh, From Development to Democracy, which will I guess officially be released on September 6th. But people seem somehow to get their hands on it before. I'm not sure how. Uh, so the book already seems to exist. Uh, so we'll be talking about the book today. But really, more than anything, this is just a chance to try to get people back to the center. Uh, it's been a tough couple of years of doing almost everything virtually. And you know, we tried to do a little more uh, in person last year, but you know, not too much. So hopefully, you know, people here will get to you know, encounter old friends, uh, meet new people. We'll have a reception afterwards. Everyone is welcome to, to stay. And hopefully, people throughout the semester and throughout the academic year will you know, come out, uh, come out to the events that we're having. Uh, our, our calendar is here. We're going to have a lot, of, a lot of great events. This is a very interdisciplinary center. Uh, you know, we have four postdoctoral fellows who are anthropologists, sociologists, political scientists. So we're really committed to a very global, very interdisciplinary study of all questions related to democracy and authoritarianism. And so if you, like us, are concerned with the direction that our world has been going, that our country has been going in a lot of ways, uh, and would like to see and you know, be part of the interdisciplinary conversations, bringing research to bear, but thinking about policy and thinking about how to actually uh, champion democracy and try to advance democracy as well as understand it. Uh, hopefully, uh, you'll be a, a regular attendee at, uh, at the events that we have. We've got some really tremendous people who are associated with the center. So look us up, see the kind of stuff that we do, um, and thank you so much for coming out. We're also really pleased today that uh, Mary Gallagher, who is the, d the director of the International Institute, the mother of the mothership, if you will, um, is, is here today. So she will be serving as moderator Q&A. I'm sure she'll put me in line for whatever jokes I make. Um, <laughs> and won't let me get too far, too far afield. <clears throat> she runs the whole building. I have one little corner of one floor. So, um, but it's really, it's very exciting for us. Um, Joe and I have been working on this book for, for a while together. It's finally come to fruition. We, we hope it says something important and interesting and intriguing and new about the world historical moment that we're in. Um, I think it's pretty much all grim out there in terms of what we're hearing about democracy's prospects. Uh, and so hopefully what we have to say today will provide some ideas about how things can, you know, have historically gone maybe better than we would expect. Uh, maybe give us some food for thought about how things might go uh, better in, in the years to come uh, and in places that we might not expect, including in East Asia, which is usually thought of as particularly bad terrain for democracy to take root. So, um, so Joe's going to kick us off and talk about sort of the first, do the first half of the presentation and then I'll... Uh, I'll go from there, and we'll open it up and to questions from everybody. So thanks again for coming. Great. Thank you so much, um, Dan. Thanks, Mary, for uh, running the whole building uh, <laughs> and allowing us I the space at the very <laughs> top of the building. And thanks to all of you for making it out for this event. This really is momentous for many reasons. One is the book is finally out. Um, but it's momentous as well because it's the first time for many of us including myself, where we have the opportunity to be engaged with colleagues and with students and with thinkers and people who share concerns with us when it comes to questions of democracy. And to be able to do it in person is really energizing. It's also terrific to see old friends, uh, to see Dan's mom, to see Rhea, to have my son in the audience. It really is a family and friend affair. Let me begin by actually just um, thanking Dan uh, for working with me uh, over the last 10 years uh, on this book. It's been an incredible journey. Um, we sometimes joke, you know, the contract for the book, uh, which has been published by Princeton, was brought to us around 2014 or so, and we promised the manuscript to Princeton University Press in 2016 or so. And we finally got it to them in 2021 or so. So it's about five years late. I say that in part because it's been an incredible journey that we've been able to be on together. It's not like we were sitting around doing nothing. Uh, we found ourselves doing interviews in Myanmar. We found ourselves doing interviews in Ethiopia, testing our theory in different settings, and certainly in some pretty august settings there as well. 
We found ourselves traipsing across China, spending time in Hong Kong, uh, and you know, at all points across North America, where we really were refining the ideas and the arguments and the way in which we wanted to formulate uh, the book. So it allowed us the journey, but I also want to say that I think the timing of the release of the book, frankly, couldn't be better. Uh, we are in a moment where there seems to be a showdown, uh, and as I've described it, a really sort of the looming shadow of authoritarianism is only making things darker, uh, and the showdown, as Dan's intimated, seems to be one that is increasingly bleak. Um, and so it's, I think it's a really great opportunity for us to actually think about democracy historically in a region in which we might not expect democracy to take root, uh, but also I think for us to really think about and um, safeguard against the fragility of democracy as we um, confront challenges to it around the world, but also here um, in the West and in North America. So. Um, in many ways, um, the book is, is, a, is an ode, if you will, or certainly takes some inspiration from uh, modernization theory, which links development and democracy together, which is somewhat ironic given that both Dan and I were graduate students in the 1990s where it was not really in vogue to think about modernization theory. In fact, we thought of every possible reason to critique it and to reject it. But you know, as we begin the book, we really do stress there is a relationship, a complicated relationship, but there is a relationship between development and democracy. And we wanted to really understand that and in all of its complexities in this very varied region that is called Asia. We look at it in terms of a historical process. So when you have a chance to take a look at the book, it really is, I think, a terrific narrative, uh, of a, a historical narrative of political and economic development we might call it the modernization of different parts of Asia, and how in some cases that proved really fertile and really fortuitous ground for democracy to take root, and in some cases where it doesn't. Modernization theory is oftentimes critiqued as being a structural theory and being overly structural and overly determined, and as a result, um, uh, ethnocentric as well. And we take absolutely, uh, we don't argue against that at all. Uh, all of those things are absolutely right. And so, but we do nonetheless want to capture the sort of structural transformations that take place across this entire region. And so when you do read the book, I think it does have a really nice, um, uh, it captures a really nice narrative of how things developed in Taiwan, how things developed in Cambodia. It takes you through the complexities of political, economic development and transformation in Thailand, which I would suggest you read and reread because it is such a complicated story. So we do want to capture those structural forces that, uh, um, that are taking place, but also recognizing that there are historical processes, there are historical decisions being made. Structural forces don't choose democracy. Structural forces may make democracy more possible, uh, but structural forces don't ultimately make choices. It was No Tae Woo, for instance, in South Korea who decides to concede in June of 1987 that presidential elections would occur later that year and National Assembly elections would take place in March of 88. Structural forces don't make those decisions. So just as this is a story of economic and political development in 12 cases in the region, it's also a story of, of individuals. It's a story of the decisions that Suharto makes. It's a story of Jiang Jingguo and the decisions he makes. It's a story of the conversations between Chen Duhuan and No Tae Wu in South Korea in the summer of 1987. Indeed, it's also a story of, um, you know, of, of McCarthy and, um, and people like Yoshida in post-war Japan. All of this taken together then, when we think about these historical transformations that are taking place and that these are, are dotted by historical decisions made by individuals, what drives this book is the paradox that both Dan and I wrote in our 2013 piece in Perspectives on Politics which is the, pers the, the paradox of strong state or democracies through strength. The paradox being that it's precisely those regimes that are strong enough to resist democratization are precisely those regimes that are in the best position to democratize with stability and indeed democratize with uninterrupted development. And it's that paradox that really drives um, this book. 
The start of the book, actually, in the first, I think, 10, 12 pages or so, we begin with an illustrative comparison between these two cases here, the case of Philippines and the case of South Korea. And we begin the book, really, with uh, an, a narrative account of what happens in the Philippines, and we describe that as the sort of paradigmatic case or example of democracy through weakness, right? It's the example of democracy emerging through the, uh, through the rise of the people power revolutionary movement. It, it arises due to the exile of a thoroughly delegitimated and discredited autocrat uh, in the form of, uh, of Marcos. And we contrast that with what we argue theoretically is democracy through strength. And the argument we make there is that the counterexample in the case of South Korea is in which you might have actually a relatively strong regime conceding democratic transition and through that concession allowing for or laying the ground for a stable transition and indeed in the case of South Korea and other successful examples of democracy through strength, uninterrupted uh, development. The end of the book uh, brings us to, a, a, I think, a rather provocative observation, um, which is around China. And if you take, then, the logic of our argument that democracy need not necessarily emerge from the ashes of a collapsed regime, but that, in fact, democracy can emerge from a relatively strong regime and, indeed, relatively stable and continually developing democracies can emerge from these strong regimes, we put to the reader the prospect that maybe democracy might emerge in the case of China through strength. And indeed, uh, we should be encouraging regime elites in that autocracy to consider a route like democracy through strength. In other words, to pursue what No Te Wu pursues here and to avoid uh, the fate that Marcos experiences in the mid-1980s. Putting a book together like this involves a lot of choices. And we have here the table of contents, uh, um, in part to entice you into thinking, wow, these are terrific chapters. I should really read them. Um, but they're also reflective of some very specific choices. And I just want to point to two in particular. The first is, Dan and I debated, do we start with the case of Taiwan, which if you know the story of Taiwan, is the paradigmatic case of democracy through strength. It's the example that we really leverage in the article version. And we thought, well, maybe we should start with Taiwan because that's the best example and then move from there. We actually chose to start with Japan. And we chose to start, and there was a lot of debate. This is one of the reasons why the book took a while because we really want, we, you know, we, we really had a debate in terms of do we want to start with not our best example, but one that actually runs counter to received conventional wisdom, which is that democracy arrived in Japan because it was essentially, essentially externally imposed on Japan. And we don't deny that, of course, the United States and the US occupation plays a huge role in Japan's democratic development. But we also highlight and unearth some evidence that suggests that, in fact, the conservative uh, elites, and particularly those that uh, were born out of the Taisho era of democracy in the 1920s and 1930s, their persistence and resilience through the transition period of 45 to 46 laid the groundwork of a conservative-led democracy. In fact, when, the, um, uh, when SCAP first approached the Japanese conservative elite to draw up a constitution, the constitution they drew up was exactly the same as the Meiji constitution. These were not Democrats. These were not shrinking violets who basically said, we're politically rolling over and simply accepting whatever it is that you're going to impose upon us. They continued to believe in a Meiji-style democracy and a Meiji-style constitution. Of course, the constitution that was imposed in 1946 is very different. But the point is, is that beginning around 1946-47, these conservatives recognized that democracy actually is the route for which they can continue to consolidate political power. And indeed, through the formation of the LDP in 1955, we see the roots of Japanese-style democracy taking place through conservative concessions that took place between 46 and 47. We started the book with that case because one, it again counters conventional wisdom, but two, um, it, it, it reorientates how we think about the region. And in fact, it very nicely then lays out the story we tell about Taiwan because in many ways the KMT in Taiwan is really a story that mimics, takes inspiration. We call it basically the playbook that emerges out of Japan. 
The second choice we make is what we do with China. We originally had one chapter on China, or we had something on China. We presented several papers at APSA on that China chapter. And it was essentially a chapter on democracy avoidance and why does China continue to avoid democracy. And that is the argument that we uh, develop in chapter nine. But as we started writing, remember chapter um, six, I actually, we wrote up the section to sort of China to, to 1989. And we kind of thought, and Dan actually thought of this, it was like, that's really a break in the story, right? What we're really telling in 1989 is not a regime that refused to democratize. What we're actually telling is a story of a regime in 1989 that was too weak to make any concessions. And when framed that way, and when you begin to think about where the CCP was in 1989, just a decade and a half removed from the Cultural Revolution, uh, this was a party that was in many ways in disarray, this was a party that was split at very elite levels and so forth, it was actually not a party in any position that was strong enough to concede democracy, but in fact, it was, as we described there, a, uh, a, a case that was too weak to concede. Let me just really kind of finish up this section by saying we want to think about developmental Asia as a historical setting, as a particular context. And one of the things that we do, again, one of the things that took up a lot of time in the formulation of the book was how are we going to address a, an entire region. Dan is m most known for the terrific world-class work he does in Southeast Asia. My work is primarily in Northeast Asia, and indeed, for many folks around here who study Asian politics, you know that we typically have Southeast Asianists and Northeast Asianists. How do we have these two regions actually in conversation with one another? And this was something that we wanted to, to do, but this was something that we puzzled over. And what we came up with was a clustering of cases, not necessarily based on geography, not necessarily based on level of economic development, not necessarily in terms of the size of the economy and so forth, but rather in terms of the style of uh, political economic development. And this allowed us then to have the region form, uh, be reformulated into clusters, right? And that these clusters themselves allowed us then to have the region in dialogue with one another. And what we have here, and I'm gonna finish this off and then pass it to Dan, is that we basically have four clusters here and these clusters, as you read the book, are not just descriptive. They're not just simply empirical um, boxes to sort the cases. We also uh, use these clusters and the styles of political economic development to help explain political economic outcomes, to help explain the likelihood of democracy to emerge within that cluster or the unlikelihood of democracy to emerge within that cluster. That allows us then to have a China case, which is very wealthy, which is rapidly developing and so forth, in dialogue with Vietnam and Cambodia. They share, for instance, a developmental socialist tradition, a political economic style of development that is distinctive and that has some explanatory power in trying to explain what it is that we are explaining, why uh, Asia experiences the uneven record of democratization that we see. I'm gonna now pass it to Dan to walk us through uh, the theory and the cases and so forth. Okay, thanks Joe, and I should thank you, of course, for the, all the great company on the journey as well. Um, it's really, really been my, my privilege to be able to work with Joe on this for sure. Um, so let me say a little bit about the, the, this theory, this idea of democracy through strength. And up until the 11th hour and throughout this long period of time we worked on this book, the book was always called Democracy Through Strength because that's the theory. That's the argument. That's the corrective that we want to offer in this book. And it basically, I think, is captured pretty well in these two columns. So if you're a graduate student and if you study democratization or a postgraduate student, Basically, our view is that the way we explain how democracy comes about in the world is basically the left-hand column. Okay? That democracy arises through weakness. You know, the regime doesn't have strong institutions. The rulers are deeply divided. Right? Um, it's their last resort. What else can we do besides democratize? Right? Where the, the, the barbarians are at the gate. Right? They have to negotiate some kind of exit from power. Right? So don't kill us, we'll exit. Right? Uh, they concede defeat. They're no longer in power. 
Uh, it's often a product we think of, of them bungling. So dictators, they, they think they're more powerful than they are. They don't really know. So they make a bunch of very unwise decisions. So our, our post hoc stories of, of authoritarian regimes ending is usually one of collapse and confusion and keystone cops and making all these errors, right? Um, the idea, especially in the book by Asmulgu and Robinson that you might know of, that it's really the threat. Of, the only reason a dictator would ever accept democracy is under the threat of revolution. It's because they fear going down violently. Only then would they accept democratic reforms, right? Um, and in the process, their legitimacy gets relinquished. Oh, that old regime, they're gone. They're, they're, they're out of the way, no longer a relevant factor. Their collapse is sudden. And there's this real kind of upheaval among the elite. So, old ruling forces are gone and you have a whole new government. This is kind of this, it sounds sort of stylized, but I think the theories we have, and I think just the image we have in our, our mind as citizens, like how, is, like how would democracy come to China? Like how would democracy come to Singapore? How is it gonna come to new places? This is sort of what we think has to happen. And so when we see authoritarian regimes that are very strong and the rulers are not bungling their way along, um, the economy is doing well, we think, well, democracy is really, really remote possibility because the collapse is not on the, on the horizon. But basically, the, the, the stories that we find, and we find is that this is the modal way that democracy comes about in developmental Asia, are these stories of strength. Now, to be clear, every real world case is going to combine these things, right? You're not going to have a perfect example where it's everything on the right or everything on the left, okay? But we just think that the, these aspects on the right are much less better understood. And we don't really know why it would be that a regime that's strong enough to stay authoritarian might choose not to and actually level the playing field, um, open up the political prisons, allow a free press, allow multiple parties to compete, allow democracy to emerge. So these are regimes where institutions are strong rather than weak. The rulers are not highly divided. They're actually quite unified. Uh, there's a famous line by O'Donnell and Schmitter that says every regime transition begins with divides within the ruling elite. It's actually not true. But what we find is it happens sometimes when the rulers are unified enough that they actually can say, here's our strategy, here's our path forward. And in fact, what we find, um, particularly in cases like Thailand, Myanmar, Indonesia, is that when these regimes divide, they don't democratize. What they do is they purge. They get rid of the people who are dividing the regime, they unify the regime, and only once things are unified and stabilized again, then they think about democratizing, because they can do so in a way they can control and it's not totally out of, out of their hands. Okay? Um, this can be a proactive strategy. They don't do this because they're, you know, up, their backs are against the wall. They do this at moments of their own choosing, which I'll say a little bit more about. Um, they don't negotiate their way out. They do it unilaterally. They level the playing field because it will give them certain legitimacy payoff. Right? They don't concede defeat. They concede democracy. So the idea is, let's compete. We, we believe we can keep winning if we hold freer and fairer elections. Okay? So this is really a key distinction. Don't concede defeat, you concede democracy. And I think this is really what people don't tend to understand. I think, like, why would the CCP ever give up power, like in China? They don't have to give up power. They can democratize and not give up power. They can democratize and compete and continue to win. And we're pretty sure they would continue to win for quite some time. Um, these are, you know, these are not all seen dictators. They're not, you know, they're not omniscient. Um, but they're also not bungling. They're, these are experiments. And what we see consistently throughout these cases is when these democratic reforms begin, it's a reversible experiment. And so they pursue certain reforms, and if it gets out of control, and if they lose a lot more power more quickly, or if it radicalizes, or if development gets destabilized, they can pull it back. Okay? And so these things are gradual. Um, they tend to happen relatively gradually, not overnight. And really, I think the, the, the really vital distinction more than anything maybe is not the threat of revolution, but your expectations of stability. If you don't think that democratic reforms are going to lead to more political stability or be consistent with political stability, you don't do it. So it's not the threat of dying, the threat of revolution, right? It's an expectation of stability, which I think is quite, quite different, okay? In these situations, again, these old authoritarian regimes don't just relinquish their legitimacy, they redefine it. They become, you know, so the standard kind of line would be, we brought development to the country, now we're bringing democracy. Look at us, aren't we great, right? Um, these aren't a sudden collapse, as I said, sequential concessions through this experiment. And rather than elites totally be in an upheaval, so all the outsiders are now in, all the insiders are now out, there's a lot of continuity in terms of who is in power. So the picture of No Teu taking the, the oath of office, he's changed his suit, he's no longer in a military outfit, he's, he's wearing a suit, nicer suit than I'm wearing, 
but he's able to stay in power, redefining who, who he is and how, how he rules. Um, and those of you, again, who are like, if, you're, if you really know this literature, you might say, well, is this really new? So there are a lot of works out there that I think get us sort of to the precipice of the argument that we make, but they're really all kind of about either sort of preemptive liberalization, so it's not, you don't get real democracy from this, but in fact, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, you do get real democracy from this, at least you can under certain circumstances, or they're all talking about exits. The assumption is democracy means the dictator exits. Okay? It doesn't have to be the case. Okay. So that's just sort of the, um, the idea, and then how, so how does this come about? And here, here, the key here are these two concepts at the right side of the diagram. So victory confidence and stability confidence. Okay, so an authoritarian regime is not gonna do this unless they have both victory confidence and stability confidence. And hopefully they're pretty, it's pretty intuitive what we mean by that. Victory confidence is the belief that you will continue to fare well in free and fair elections. You can win, right? If we democratize the system, we can still win. Stability confidence is the confidence that if we democratize, the place will not become totally unstable. It won't lead to civil war. It won't lead to a collapse. It won't lead us to us losing all our corruption opportunities. This is not some like, you know, sort of beautifully perfect story where all good things happen, right? A lot of times these are dictators who have to believe that, again, you're not gonna totally change the way the economy works so that they can no longer benefit, right? And basically, in its barest terms, what the argument we make is, and the way we tie economic development to democracy through strength is, if you have a long track record of economic development, like the KMT in Taiwan, or like the PAP in Singapore, or like the CCP in China, or like UMNO in Malaysia, what you, you develop a track record. Okay? You have a track record, you have a reputation, people associate you with economic development. And a really key point here is, developmental states create developmental voters. Okay. If what politics is all about is delivering economic development, it's what you expect. It's what you come to look for. And so essentially you can, as the autocrat, democratize to voters who you've socialized to, to value the things that you have provided for decades. Right? So with this track record, this can give you victory confidence, especially if you're a strong political party. Okay? Also, if you've pursued a kind of economic development that's led to substantial poverty reduction, um, as in much of, of East Asia, this gives you more stability confidence. Because one reason why democracy is often resisted is because of fear that redistributive conflict would be just way too intense. The poor are so poor, the rich are so rich, if you give the poor the right to vote, it's gonna lead to this enormous upheaval and redistribution, right? So to the extent you've had poverty reduction, again, it should give you more stability confidence. Again, and there are more people who are invested in the economy working as it, as it does. Okay, so this is the really kind of basic way. But at the end of the day, victory confidence and stability confidence are the most important thing to look for. That's the most important takeaway, I think, from, from our argument. Okay, so then the question is, well, why would they ever do it? If you're strong enough to stay in power, why would you, why would you do it? And I'm not going to go through, through every piece of the theory here. Um, we do talk about it in more depth in this article that Joe mentioned from 2013. But the key point I want to make here is, Strength itself doesn't explain why you democratize through strength, because lots of strong regimes don't do it. So the question is, why do some strong regimes do it and some strong regimes don't? So the strengths are obviously a prerequisite, institutional strength, strong state, strong ruling party, strong economy, right? But you need these signals, okay? these signals of incipient weakness. If the regime thinks that it's at the peak of its powers, that it's cruising along, it's all in cruise control, it faces no challenges whatsoever, it's very unlikely to change shape, right? So there needs to be a rise in pressure and uh, some signal that you're not as strong as you used to be, okay? But this is still a far cry from, again, revolutionary threat, the idea that you're about to be tossed out, right? So we talk about four kinds of signals, um, electoral signals, geopolitical signals, contentious signals, economic signals. So there are a variety of ways that regimes say, you know what, we might want to think about changing our formula, right? Not giving up power, not saying, oh, those opponents, they're great, we're going to give them power. That's not what they do. Right? They say, let's try to do things in a, in a different way. And at the end of the day, and this goes back to Joe's vital point about it's someone's got to choose it. Someone's got to actually have the political courage to say this is the strategy that is going to work. And they have to be able to bring together the ruling group behind that strategy. So it's not just one genius or one brilliant person does this. Right? In the case of Indonesia, BJ Habibi was the person who said, well, here's what we're going to, here's what I propose we do. Let's call rapid elections. Let's empty the political prisons. Let's get rid of the Ministry of Information, which is used for censorship and all these things. And he was an incredibly weak leader. So the puzzle is, why did the whole government go along with him? Why were they okay with it? And the reason they were okay with it was they said, you know what, we're going to be okay. 
if we do this, this is actually going to get us out of some troubles that we're in. Okay? But it's not just, again, one person. You need to think about the whole coalition of forces. But it does, at the end of the day, come down to these strategies that have to be pursued. So just to give you a sense of when and the where, so the, the six cases that we say did pursue these concessions at some time or another, you see Japan in the 1950s, Taiwan in the 80s and 90s, South Korea in the 80s, Indonesia in the 90s, Thailand in the 80s, and Myanmar in the 2010s, a democratic experiment, liberalization experiment that lasted about 10 years before the coup in 2021. And then we have six cases, which we call these avoidance cases. So Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, China, Vietnam, Cambodia, all have enough strength, all have had enough strength to concede democracy through strength, but they haven't, right? So then the question becomes why? And here is where the idea of clusters sort of came in, because we realized by looking, these are not randomly you know, different cases. These, are, these cases are different from each other in some pretty systematic ways if you know anything about, about the region. And so here's where we get the idea of the four, the four clusters. And let me just take a few minutes to kind of talk you through how this works. So the idea is on the top, the six cases on the top are all the cases of highest strength. They're the richest places, strongest ruling parties, strongest state apparatus, most stable, okay, right? But only on the left did you get democratic concessions. On the right, you don't. So, for, so right away, you should realize it's not just modernization. It's not just as you get richer, eventually you do this. Because Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong all became very, very strong middle to higher income authoritarian regimes, but did not pursue these democratic concessions. Okay? In the bottom half of the diagram, these are the cases of more intermediate strength, which are again clustered into these militarist cases, strong ruling military, and the socialist cases. Okay? These are all you know, weaker than, poorer than the, the cases at the top. And here yet again, we only get preemptive democratic reforms on the left side of the diagram, not on the right side of the diagram. So again, it's not predicted by if, if modernization theory were all you needed, just the higher you are, then the more democratic you are, period. That's all there is to it, right? But the fact of the matter is, these are very different kinds of political economies. They're very different kinds of places. And so we sort of realized that, you know, once you recognize that basically two of the four clusters all did it, two of the four clusters all didn't do it, it tells you, to us, there's something about the cluster. It's something about the kind of political economy, something about the way you're situated in the world, Something about the role the government plays. The, how strong is your, are your private markets? It's something. How big is your middle class? Something. And it's, that's, that's sort of where the history really comes in. There's no simple story for why your cluster predicts whether you do these democratic reforms or not. But I think it gives you a nice way of sorting the cases and thinking about them in a more, more systematic and organized way. And then I will say one thing that, w that we do learn, though, is the lower you are, the riskier it is. The harder it is to pull this off. Okay, so it is absolutely within the realm of our theory that it's in Thailand and in Myanmar where these experiments got reversed. Okay, they had the least strength through which to actually democratize and consolidate democracy. They lost victory confidence, they lost stability confidence. Okay, it, so we do sort of predict that. Our theory does explain that, why Thailand and Myanmar. Indonesia had a much stronger ruling political party than either Thailand or Myanmar, which we think is the best explanation for why Indonesia remains a democracy today, despite all kinds of reasons we think it might not be. Um, the other set of cases that we talk about in the book, um, what we call these embittered cases, there's also cases that didn't reverse, but they're cases that were strong enough to democratize from strength, but have weakened. They basically missed their opportunity and now have these substantially weakened, and they no longer could. And the cases of that are Cambodia, Hong Kong, and Malaysia on the right side. So if you follow what's going on in Hong Kong, I mean, if 15 years ago, if basically any political party was allowed to form, everyone was allowed to vote, conservatives in Hong Kong would have won, right? That is no longer the case. They've completely lost their window to, to do that. Cambodia as well, there was a, a spell in the, kind of the late 2000s, around 2010, that the ruling CPP was doing quite well. They were winning local elections. There wasn't a whole lot of repression around elections, at least. Um, and they then blew that. That was their big chance, right? And then Malaysia, which might be the case that I've studied the most closely, uh, again, this was a very, very dominant authoritarian government, um, which very, and very, very popular. No question that in the mid-1990s, late 1990s, if they had simply said, we're going to like, get rid of all these ridiculous controls on the opposition, we're going to open things up, there's absolutely no question they would have continued to win elections. But they didn't. They repressed. They cracked down. And over time, they eventually they lost popularity. They lost legitimacy. And they were thrown out um, through the ballot box in 2018. 
So you can miss your opportunity. So if you're wondering, and this is crazy, of course if you're a dictator, you're going to wait as long as possible. You're not going to do this if, right, if you're already in power. Like, why would you take the risk? Well, these three cases tell you why you would take the risk. Because if you're in Malaysia, Hong Kong, Cambodia, right, you've lost, at least from the perspective of political stability, like you've missed your best opportunity to be able to rule in a way that's, again, more stable and more, more lasting. Okay? So we could talk about all of these cases, but we want to be able to open things up. Let me just kind of conclude with some broader points from the, from the book. So this region of developmental Asia is usually considered uniquely ill-suited for democratization. Um, and these are, this is often these culturalist accounts. People talk about Confucian values, Asian values. Like Asia is just not somewhere where democracy is supposed to um, take root. Democracy is Western. Democracy is not Eastern, right? Um, and what we're showing is actually you've got some very, very strong Eastern democracies. You know, it's hard, even as we see democracy come under assault and weaken and backslide in some of the places we thought it was most steady, including the United States, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea are three of the steadiest, sturdiest, and most substantive stable democracies in the world, right? So how did this happen? We have an account for that. And so if we think about what you need for democracy is not the right culture, you need the right institutions, right? You need strong institutions, not some kind of values. Then, uh, then this is not surprising. Then it makes sense why you have these strong Eastern democracies. Um, it's also worth noting that th this modal path this democratization path is actually more comparable to older European cases than similarly young democracies. We usually think you should compare cases to things happening around the same time. Then we think they're more comparable. But in fact, and as our co-author and friend um, Daniel Ziblatt argues that in, in Western Europe, in fact, it was conservative parties who said, you know what, we're not scared of democracy because we can win elections if we play by the rules. Right? And that was how you got a smoother path to democracy in places like, uh, like the United Kingdom. Okay? Um, I also think this should a big point of this book is we should look at authoritarian regimes, how they operate in a day-to-day -day basis more carefully. The institutions they have, the policies they pursue, their developmental track records shape their long-term potential for having either a stabilizing or a destabilizing concession process. We focus, we obsess so much on whether the dictatorship is going to survive or whether it's going to collapse. Okay? And we're trying to give us a way of thinking about these things that's not smushing everything into this question of survival and collapse. How they operate tells us what's likely to follow. Because again, those strongest authoritarian regimes have led to the most stable democracies. Okay? So it, it has these lasting consequences. It's also, I think, important to note that this democratic recession happening around the world, democratic backsliding, what, whatever you, you call it, it largely is about a lack of confidence that democracy and stability can go together. If you talk today in a place like China, well, why not democracy? They say, well, look at Egypt. Look at the Soviet Union. Like, there's this, if democracy means instability, you're not going to get democracy. Okay? Because nobody wants, or very few people want instability. Most people don't want instability. And so democracy has to be able to solve these problems of stability or else it's really in danger or not going to happen. And that's the final point, and our conclusion is largely about this point. We think democracy is a universal value. Okay. That's something that we learned from our shared advisor, Edward Friedman, University of Wisconsin. That's one of the things he really instilled us. Democracy is a universal value. It's not a Western value. It's not, it's, it's, it is universal, right? But so is authoritarianism. Okay? <laughs> and so the problem for democracy is it's not the ultimate end of politics. People are worried about, you know, they want to be safe. They want to be prosperous. They want, you know, they want other things besides democracy. So what this book really tries to do is speak about when does democracy lead to those other things? When does it lead to those other things that people care about and when does it not? And we believe that unless we kind of build stronger democracies that actually can answer the challenge of peace, answer the challenge of prosperity, um, that it will be, remain forever and everywhere challenged and in, under risk. And it doesn't matter if you're west or east or north or south. That, we think, is a sort of universal feature of, of democracy and what, what threatens it around the world. So I will stop there and open it up for, for questions. Um, again, thanks very much for coming out. It's great to kick off the new year with such a big crowd. And hope we'll be seeing you guys around throughout the year. Dan, thanks, Joe. Thanks, Mary. Great talk. Um, I'm going to ask the first question, if please, that's okay. Please do. But please get ready and raise your hand. And we do have people on Zoom who will also be asking questions. Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. And I will give you both. And you can decide whether you want to answer one or 
the other. Yeah. Neither. Um, one question I have is how deterministic is the theory? So as I was reading uh, parts of the book yesterday and then hearing the talk today, I really did wonder about whether or not um, there's a certain, like if you're in these, you know, for, and I'm thinking about China in particular, is in this uh, developmental socialist um, group, it seems like there are certain, this is related to the second question I want to ask, there are certain limitations on a socialist regime to make these decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my question is how deterministic is it? Um, and then relatedly, it seems to me that the key difference of the developmental socialist group is not so much the political economy because as we saw in China, the political economy did change pretty substantially. It's been rolled back a lot in the last five years. Um, but to me, the, the key difference is the ideological commitment of the party, which is related to the elite splits. And it seems to me that the problem for a lot of ideological regimes, like socialist regimes, is that elite splits are dangerous because they lead to the threat of death. Mm -hmm. And so the, the elite, it's interesting that you say, you know, that elite mm -hmm. splits don't always happen. Um, I, I'm taking your word on that. I, I, they seem like they would happen, but maybe they're less severe in the countries that you see transitioning. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me the, tr the, the threat within China right now over making some sort of choice of, of a, a different choice than China mm -hmm. is currently making is mm -hmm. that um, the elite division would be so severe and mm -hmm. less even worried about kind of social unrest or social challenges to the party, but rather the internal party dynamics would be so dangerous that nobody wants to risk it. Those are my two questions. That's great. Can I start, Jeff? Sure. I'll, I'll, uh, I mean, those are great questions. And, and not surprisingly, I think ones that we you know, thought a lot about as we were writing the book. I mean, I remember you know, even early on when we were talking about our theory, remember it was at, it was at one app, so I was like, is it a theory or is it, you know, is it, a, is it a, an explanation? You know, like is, is there predictive power in here? And, you know, we, and, we, and we had long conversations about that. And I think that certainly from my reading of it, you know, is that there is, you know, there, what, it, what it suggests is that strong regimes and as we described it, once they pass their apex of power, there is this, what we call the bittersweet spot, mm -hmm. in which the probability of uh, a decision like this being made is higher, and the probability that the regime, the closer it is to that apex of power, that the ensuing political economy of development, of democratic stability and so forth, will be more stable, right? It's about probabilities. It's not. It's not about uh, absolutes. And I and I and I think that I'm pretty confident in in that kind of assertion. Um, now that being said, you know, as, as I pointed out and as Dan reiterated, you know, in the end, it does come down to individuals making decisions and making strategic decisions. And it is difficult to know. You know, we we don't really know what Jiang Jingguo was thinking in '85 to '87. Mm -hmm. We have a pretty good sense now because, you know, Li Donghui was taking notes as his secretary, and we've got a chance to read those. He was no Democrat, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not like he said, "Well, I'm suddenly a Democrat." We do get a sense through the decisions he makes as evidence of a strategic rationale that if we do democratize this will be pretty good. So it does come down to these kinds of decisions. As we describe in the book, you know, Note Wu, for instance, in the case of South Korea, is oftentimes celebrated as the one who makes these concessions. But as we describe in the book, actually, it was Chen Duhuan who was the real bastard, right, from mm -hmm. 81 to 86, yeah. who says, like, you know, this may be a good time to concede, because we could all kind of get off scot-free here mm -hmm. if you were to make these decisions. And Note Wu actually was terrified. He's mm -hmm. like, I don't really know if that's the way one. And, and so there actually required some convincing. And so there are individuals, people matter. So to the point about China, I'm with you 100%. You know, I mean, I think there is, uh, and, and, and Dan um, can elaborate more on the developmental socialist cluster more generally, but you know, these are regimes founded on revolutionary um, uh, origins. Mm -hmm. um, they are deathly afraid of instability. Their mythology is one, and their ideology is one in which, uh, in their absence, the country will for sure fall apart, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. And so, you know, in many ways, it's not surprising um, what we're seeing in China today. 
Uh, and certainly, you know, um, as, as Xi Jinping continues to consolidate power, anticipating, I think, some of the really disastrous splits that you've intimated, um, it seems less and less likely that this will happen. But it's consistent with the cluster, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's consistent with the same kinds of uh, avoidance strategies that we see uh, in both Cambodia and Vietnam. And in there, the case is even less compelling given that those regimes are not nearly as strong as the CCP right. is. Yeah. Well, Dan, I, you know, I don't know if you want yeah. to add more to that. I mean, I think it's, it's interesting this point, and Mary, of course, knows China so much better than yeah. I do Joe myself, so yeah. this is, you know, it's great to have you here asking these questions. Um, so on this question of splitting the party, it's a different way of thinking about it. So if we do it, we're not split now, but it could split us if we do it, right? Well, I guess my take would be, first of all, you know, what Mahathir Mohammed did in Malaysia really split the party, mm -hmm. big time, using repression rather than reform split the party. I think what Xi Jinping is doing right now in China arguably is really splitting the party. Mm -hmm. I think there's, you know, we'll see how it goes. In October, we're going to have a session on the, uh, on the next the CCP Congress. We'll see what happens. Um, but I think there's got to be a lot of disgruntlement within the upper reaches of the CCP right now over the kind of personalization of power that's been going on in, in, in China. Um, and in fact, this, we, this didn't come up in the talk, but you know, it's so vital. One of the main reasons why you do this, why you democratize through strength, is it splits your opponents. It doesn't split the regime, it splits your opponents. So in South Korea and in Indonesia, there were incredibly strong, growing opposition movements that were very unified. What were they unified by? The dictatorship. They were unified because they all hated the dictatorship. So when you say, hey, let's take dictatorship off the table, right? Mm -hmm. They calculated it's going to split our opponents, and that's exactly what happened. Both South Korea and Indonesia, the opposition became much more, much weaker, much more divided after you did democratic reform than before. So this, so you're exactly right to focus on well, what's this going to mean for splits? And we haven't, I probably haven't done enough to think about, well, what would the logic be of why it would split the regime rather than not? But I think it's, it's an open question, a really important one. Um, on the question of determinism, um, I think there are aspects of the argument that are somewhat deterministic and parts that aren't. And let me just give you a, an example here. So when I say Thailand and Myanmar right, are the least likely, they're the most likely to get a reversal because of the historical, the lack of antecedent institutional strength they've built up. Most likely to reverse. That's a deterministic you know, argument. That's pretty, that's pretty structural. That's pretty, you know. Mm -hmm. When we say Singapore, if Singapore conceded democratic elections, they would fare better than basically anybody else on this chart you know, mm -hmm. for at least some spell of time. That's a pretty deterministic argument. So I think the kind of strength that regimes build up over time give you a pretty good idea. You know, as we say, the, the, your spectrum of strength under authoritarianism pretty deterministically says something about your spectrum of success after you democratize. Okay? That I think is pretty, that's a pretty structural argument. Okay? Um, I think we're kind of left to the question of how much can cases jump clusters or, or do things that, they, that their cluster hasn't done. The problem is we have zero cases, mm -hmm. right? We don't know. You know so it's, it's, it's to us we're sort of left, you know, we're both, you know, we're observers, right? We're not just, we don't just try to explain things, we're looking at things. And when you look, and for us it was just a sort of, just huge aha moment. When you look and say, oh, like the six that haven't all have these features in common. The six that have, have all have these features in common. Why would that be? And there's a lot of reasons why we think they might. We have reasons why we think it's hard China's not Indonesia. They can't just say, well, it's be like Indonesia, right? But how hard would it be? How difficult would it be? Um, there, I think, you know, again, it's deterministic in the sense that, I mean, China is not going to have suddenly have these incredibly strong rule of law institutions as opposed to, you know, strong party and bureaucratic institutions, like overnight, right? Like whether or not you have strong military, whether you have a stronger party, whether you have a strong bureaucracy, whether you have a strong parliament, whether you have a strong judiciary, these are pretty structural things. These are hard things to change. And so in that respect, it's hard for, and we see with all the problems China has in ruling Hong Kong, right? I mean, Hong Kong is in a different cluster. It's very, very hard for China to govern Hong Kong through just, it's a totally different kinds of institutions, right? And so I think it's, it certainly makes it harder. And, you know, I mean, time will tell, but we don't, I think, have a really deterministic claim that, like, oh, you couldn't do it here. I think all of them could do it, mm -hmm. right? But they're less likely to, partly because of the ideological stuff that you mentioned, for sure. You know, it's also it's interesting too because that again the, one of the choices we made in putting Japan as our first case, and it's a pretty I mean, 
You know, we haven't given as many talks on that chapter in Japan. I am curious and a little bit, or at least I haven't. I'm bracing myself a little mm -hmm. bit um, because it is a pretty different kind of read on the situation because th the argument there is that it, Japan emerges from the, the ashes of World War II, is that it's not a tabula rasa, but that in fact there is an inheritance of the kinds of structural um, forces and, and institutions that made up Taisho era democracy, mm -hmm. most importantly political parties. Mm -hmm. And elites who knew conservative elites who knew how to run political parties, right? Yeah. Uh, so in many ways, the Liberal Party and the Democratic Party, which were the antecedents to the LDP, they were essentially the revival of Taisho era mm -hmm. Democratic parties that got, eventually got squeezed out and pushed out by military fascists. But it wasn't the case that this was a tabula rasa that you know we're imposing a whole new constitution, we're building institutions right. anew, and. We're building a, you know, we're building a political elite class in you. No, they were, they were actually, those structures, um, you know, carried through uh, and 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 mattered a great deal. And that's yeah. why we started with that chapter, because it was one of the most sort of counterintuitive readings, but it allowed us to resuscitate the era of the 20s and 30s in a meaningful mm -hmm. and and in the end you know, causally explanatory way to, to help make sense of what happens after 47. Yeah. We're definitely very historical. How structural it is, I think, is yeah. a kind of, <laughs> I, th I think we change from day to day. <laughs> but we're definitely historical. So yes, questions from the audience? Oh, oh wow. Oh, okay. Let's see. I see Tyler first and in the, and the, well, go, go ahead. Do you want me to do one by one? Whatever you think works. Let's take, okay, go. We'll go one, one, one by one for now. So Tyler and then Sarah, right? Sarah in the back. Go ahead, Tyler. Oh, uh, hi. Do I need to introduce myself? I'm sorry. Do you, do I need to introduce myself or? Sure. Okay, so I'm Tyler. I'm a master's student here in international regional studies. I'm also a graduate fellow at the WCED. So I'm asking questions to my bosses here. <laughs> 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 And uh, I have a question because, like, I'm very interested about the political and the relationship between political parties and military. Yeah. So I'm wondering, like, uh, you you talk about in the book that uh, the military regimes can try to uh, go in democracy for trials because they have the power to reverse the experiment. Yeah. Uh, one interesting case is that socialist parties tend to have uh, overall control over military, such as in Vietnam and in China. Yeah. So why not? Why these uh, uh, socialist par parties? They didn't. They didn't go for a trial in, in democracies. And what would happen? And what the difference it would be if they go on trial for democracy? What's the, what? What? What would you expect? Like the differences, the outcomes, uh, like how things will go different in China and Vienna and in Indonesia. Thank you. It's a great question. I think. I guess it's not obvious to me why if you have strong control over the military, that wouldn't be a source of even more confidence. Right? So if, again, if one reason why you fear democratic reforms is, well, what if the military, you know, what if it can leg up? If you're, again, China or Vietnam, I think you're less likely to think so. So I think that's, at least in principle, you know, I think that's not necessarily what would, what would derail, the, derail the possibility. right? Um, and certainly in these cases, the, the, the militarist cases that we're, that we're talking about here, um, it's really important that if you're a military, and this is true in the United States too, you can be very powerful without being in government. Um, and so what that means is that, again, as a ruling military, there are more reasons why you might be willing to say, let's see how much we can give to civilians, how much space we can give to civilians. We actually describe these arrangements in Indonesia, Thailand, Myanmar as, as cohabitation. Because essentially what happens in all three cases, the military says, we're going to hold on to certain things, but let's have free and fair elections. You take part of the state. Let's see how it goes. Right? In Indonesia, the military stepped aside very quickly, but they still do very, very well politically. Right? In Myanmar, they basically calculated, you know, if you can call it a calculation, that they just couldn't accept. And in Thailand, the military decided they couldn't accept um, what was happening with civilian having what they had. And so those were cases where they really did kind of lose control of, you know, or did certainly have control over the civilian side of the process, right? And that undermined those. So again, if you want to make the argument in China, well, don't be, don't be scared. Like, you, don't worry about 
Egypt. Like, don't worry about you know those kinds of scenarios, right? That actually it would be you know a, a source of confidence rather than uh, than threat. So Sarah next, right there, and yeah, there's a couple other people, and I'll and then Adam, if you wanted after that, okay. Hi, my name is Sarah Godek. I'm a second year MPP student at the Ford School, and my individual research is related to US-China relations. So I have a question related to China. It's about the white paper that China issued this year regarding um, sort of new conceptions of democracy and democracy in China. And so my question is, where does this new trajectory fit into your theory? And does this signal a sort of permanent avoidance of democracy as we might conceptualize it in the West? And then the sort of follow-up question is, what would this mean for East Asia and Southeast Asia in the future? Sorry, that's a big question. <laughs> Great questions. I mean, I'll, I'll start by yeah. just I'm picking up on the word permanence. I mean, I think that one of the things that is, um, you know, as we intimate at the end of the book, you know, forever is, um, you know, forever is a long time, and regimes have, over the course of history, uh, no regime has lasted forever, right? Um, and so regimes, there is an impermanence to, to regimes in the end. And so, um, you know, I think in the case of China, it's interesting. You know, we've given talks uh, on this theory in China a lot, actually. And so whereas, you know, whereas, you know, some Western scholars who come in and talk about democracy and democratization, um, they're, uh, well, increasingly not allowed to or not welcome to or certainly wouldn't talk about it. We've actually always, and certainly in the talks that I've given and the conferences that we've participated in, been quite frank about what this theory um, says. And the reception actually has been quite positive in China because it's not an argument that is critiquing the regime per se, in, in the sense that this is a thoroughly delegitimated regime and it must go and, and China is going to hell because of this regime, but rather it's a regime that's actually very strong, it's very credible and so forth. Um, and so, you know, the, it's, it's actually, with, it's incentive compatible for the regime to consider uh, democratic transition, right? It actually makes a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, these, these, these white papers that have come out, certainly the actions of Xi Jinping and so forth, s signal a sense of uh, permanence in avoidance. I'm just skeptical of that because permanence is, uh, is you know, forever has never really happened, right? Um, so I would expect that at some point the regime is going to have to make these kinds of calculations. And one of the things that really interesting, I mean, as, as people who study China know, I mean, when you talk about democracy in China, they point to the Soviet Union, they always point to the, the, you know, the mistakes that the Communist Party of the Soviet Union made, which was to invite the chaos that democracy brings. Um, and, you know, so therefore, why would we ever want to choose that route? I mean, what we're essentially arguing in this book is the Communist Party of the Soviet Union chose democracy after it had passed its best before date, mm -hmm. right? After it had you know, perestroika and glasnost essentially released uh, the pent-up energy around, at that point, a very delegitimated regime. That's the fate you should avoid <coughs> if you were China. So the lesson that you should be taking in China is not that you should avoid democracy at all turns and at all costs. You should avoid democratizing when you're weak. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that counter um, narrative is, is actually finds resonance in certain pockets within China. So I'm, you know, I, I understand the the posturing, and I understand the politics that the CCP has to play, but yeah. uh, I can't imagine that that's a view that's shared with every, by everyone within the party. Yeah. I'd also say, I mean, I think U.S.-China relations are really important here um, yeah. in the sense that I think part of the resistance is this idea that, well, as long as we think of what democracy means is collapse, right, then it's like you're wishing collapse on China. You're wishing instability. You want China to fail. You want China to stop developing. You want all these bad things to happen to China to get to get this thing you call democracy, right? Um, and so I think it's really important to say no one is calling for the destabilization of the weakening of the you know undermining of political stability in in China, right? Um, but that to say, you know, that that you like others have earned. You have actually built up enough strength that you're real, what we call a candidate case. You could do democracy through strength in a way that a lot of authoritarian regimes, most authoritarian regimes arguably cannot do. You know? And so I think that 
at this point, and I think that <clears throat> treating you know, democracy, again, as a set of you know, values, Western values, it, it really only underscores the difficulty. It makes it more, it makes it more difficult to, to talk this way in China. It, it just draws these, these black and white you know, kind of divides, which I think aren't helpful. Um, and I think undermine the fact that, look, China has a very, very rich tradition of democratic thinking, lots of great democratic thinkers, you know. Um, and so it's not as if there's some lack of resources within, within China for here would be a path forward that could be more pluralistic, that could still lead to China's development and China's rise and all of these things. Um, but I do think that if you, you know, you do at some point, I think, have to get off of the America has to do everything they can, they can do to weaken China. If that's what you want, then you're not really, you, you can't really do this, right? You can't think about things in this way. You're saying you want to push for collapse, you know, and like, let's hope, let's just hope that the collapse in the housing market is going to lead to this complete collapse of the regime. And it's like, we've been saying this for decades, right? And this is like, we're trying to change the narrative about what it would mean to get democracy. Yeah, and, and not just in China. It doesn't have to mean collapse. It doesn't have to mean instability. I think the, you know, the visceral distaste and rejection of democracy and therefore the, the very um, seductive notion that democracy is Western stems from the fact that most democracy promotion is around um, the collapse of the regime, mm -hmm. right? And so it's totally it's, it's understandable. All, it's almost a synonym, yeah, right? Yeah, it's totally are, are understandable you, yeah. that yeah, that's right. why would we embrace a political economic system that actually could deliver stability and development and all the things that the regime yeah. seeks if it's predicated on our collapse. It's totally understandable that there right. would be an outright, there is a wholesale rejection. And indeed, it's, it's just as frustrating, therefore, when you read this, the celebratory tracks out there about, well, this is a regime that has resisted democracy for, you know, despite all the predictions since 1989, therefore it doesn't need to democratize. It's so, you know, it, like that's not helpful either, right? So, so what the, the implications of the book, and I think it's quite provocative at the end, is to actually say that, you know, when it comes to democracy promotion, demonizing China in this ideological contest that we see right now is not going to promote democracy in China. Uh, it's about uh, highlighting this alternative pathway that's, as we say, incentive compatible for the regime. Right. No one wishes calamity on 1.4 billion people. I mean, it's oh, disastrous so sure. for, it's disastrous <laughs> for it, everybody. Yeah, yeah. And so I totally get yeah. why um, our yeah. colleagues and friends in China reject a lot of the kind of uh, bluster that comes out from, from the West. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you want, if all you want is for America to be stronger than China, then sure, root for China to be weak. <laughs> if what you would like to see is China become more democratic, then you might want to root for China to be strong. And I, and I just think we're faced as Americans, I think you need to make that choice. You need to actually, that might be a hard thing for certain people to face. I think for a lot of people it's very morally convenient to say we hate everything about China, we want them to weaken, we want the place to fall apart, and then it will be a democracy. Um, that's a very convenient, but it doesn't really hold water based on what we find around the region at least. So I think, I think there are tougher moral choices and positions to be, to be taken than people are currently taking in the United States. So you had your hand up, and you did, Liang Yan, um, and Natalia. OK, so one, two, and three. Can, we, can I collect some now? You can absolutely. OK, so we'll absolutely. do those three people all in a row, You're the boss. and then I'll take another round. Thanks, and Mary. I, I see people in the back, too. Go ahead. OK. Hello, professors. My name is Zaire, and I'm a first, uh, first year graduate student in the MIRS program. And uh, I have two questions related to the confidence of victory. Mm. And the first one is, uh, can we consider Max Weber's uh, three types of authority as one of the factors that influence how the region uh, evaluate themselves uh, to win the future elections? And my second question is, uh, while making decisions, uh, to uh, like if they want to take a, a democracy way or not. If uh, the, 12 uh, the 12 cases in your book, mm -hmm. if they really had the confidence of victory or uh, just the wrong concept of democracy. For example, like in Taiwan, uh, we know that some of the, uh, some of the people that still can uh, claim that uh, you should thanks to the KMT because they give they give you the, the chance to, to vote, so you should respect them. 
-hmm. And yeah, I think uh, uh, this is my questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Liang Yuanzhen. I'm a first-year graduate student, also a mere student. So my question is, um, I think in the uh, democracy through strength scenario, we will as assume that dictators have full knowledge on their strengths, on their signals, so they choose to democrat, democrat so they choose democracy as a solution or a strategy. But as some recent articles, perhaps they f they point out that sometimes democracy is by mistakes, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes uh, autocrats or dictators they choose to they choose democracy because they underestimate their strengths. So my question is, what's the relationship between democracy as uh, strengths and democracy by mistakes? Thank you. Good and answer. last question from that. Natalia. And then Adam, do you want to move to the sure. Zoom people after that? Okay. Well, they, they have to answer these questions first, but after that. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Natalia Farad, and one of my hats that I'm wearing is I'm an associated WCED. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Joseph, for this book. I think it's really terrific, and I can't support enough this statement that democracy is a universal value rather than a Western one. I think it's super important in the current world. The question that I have is actually related to the implications of your argument to how we understand democracy. So one way to understand democracy is that democracy is basically a procedural thing. Like as long as procedures are followed, as long as everyone can compete in elections freely, then this is democracy. Another way to think about democracy is peaceful transfer of power. If governments change, if new people come to power, that is democracy. If we see some countries where procedures are followed, but there is no transfer of power, it's the same people staying in power again, do we know this is democracy? Do we know they would concede power if they don't win? And if you actually see a prospect of developing more of a procedural democracy, more of institutions that are valued by people for the sake of those procedures, what kind of mechanisms do you see producing those institutions? Thank you. Great. I'll, Go ahead. I'll take a stab at a couple of them then. Um, <laughs> Please. Those are terrific, terrific questions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one, one way to answer, I think, um, a cluster of these questions is around you know, what happens to what Lockston and Maine wearing and others who've contributed that volume to these authoritarian successor parties, right? So what happens, what does the KMT look like after 92 when the full legislative elections occur and after 96 when the first presidential elections occur? And I think that's a totally fair question. And, and we thought a lot about it. We don't really include much of that in the book because we really focus more on the transition and the democratic breakthrough. But we have thought a bit about that in terms of what happens with these authoritarian successor parties and the ways in which they, as um, parties, can become agents of democratic deepening as opposed to progenitors of democratic backsliding, right? And so the KMT, I think, is actually a great example of where there is, uh, rightly so, a great degree of historical distrust. And I was just recently on a podcast talking a little bit about like the emergence of a truth and reconciliation uh, process in Taiwan and how is that going to play out in terms of the white terror that the KMT unleashed and so forth. And an argument that we make in a, in, a, in a book chapter that we contributed to Jamie and Scott's book is you know, that these authoritarian successor parties, the ones that actually contribute to more stability, uh, are the ones that moderate, uh, that they become more moderate in terms of their claims. And in part, it's, it's, it's actually good politics. Once you've taken the, the uh, regime cleavage off the table, these parties have to win elections now, right? Um, and they have to win them uh, in relatively free and fair conditions. And so actually, the most successful ones are these parties that actually move intact to the center. And what we see are actually catch-all parties. And again, the, the inspiration from Japan here is, is, is instructive. The LDP moves as, uh, as a, it begins as a conservative party, but essentially becomes a catch-all party. Uh, 
the KMT in Taiwan as the party that actually initiates most of the most thorough social policy reform, it's capturing a lot of, frankly, the public policy agenda that would have been on the nominal left in Taiwan, right? These become uh, really quite moderate, centrist, catch-all parties, which I think makes a big difference, right? It actually contributes to stability. It doesn't erase history. It doesn't erase those in Taiwan who have deep, deep misgivings and deep distrust about a, a KMT regime. But it certainly normalizes these parties into now democratic competitors. Which leads then to the second, uh, the, the question that Natalia raised around um, you know, these, these dominant party regimes, right? And, and, um, and what happens um, if you don't see turnover? Essentially, what happens, like, which I think raises the very serious question then, well, is Japan a democracy before 1993? Right, because the LDP essentially governs uninterrupted for mm -hmm. almost four decades. Well, of, co of course, it's a democracy, right? Um, and so there are there are, are there are rules that are adhered to. There are norms that are adhered to, and so forth. But it does raise a really important question, right? And it, and and back in the early 2000s, um, Ed Friedman, who was our advisor at Wisconsin, he and I co-edited a book called Learning to Lose. And it asked that very question. What happens to dominant parties when they lose for the first time? And how do they learn to lose? And how do we ensure that they don't become forces for democratic backsliding, uh, but in fact become forces for democratic deepening? And part of it is, you know, as in the case of Japan, is that there is the expectation that even when you lose, you have the opportunity to compete again. And we saw that happen in 93 in Japan. We saw that happen in Taiwan in 2000 when, uh, when the KMT loses the presidency. Right? The KMT is now for the first time ever in the woods, but it's not so far in the woods that it doesn't believe it actually has, it, do, it doesn't believe that it doesn't have a legitimate shot at winning power again, which it does, uh, you know, um, a few elections later. So I think that there, is, there, there are a lot of ways in which we can rethink what democracy means. Um, in the first instance, we do take a kind of procedural look at the introduction of democratic breakthroughs, but I think we do pay a bit of attention as well in terms of what these authoritarian successor parties look like mm -hmm. and how do we avoid democratic backsliding. Sorry for taking so long, but it was, no. it was just yeah. an interesting set of questions. Definitely. Yeah, I'm glad Natalia asked the, the what does democracy mean questions. It's the opening of the year. Like, this is a good time to start. Like, so what do we, why is there Center for Emerging Democracies? What are we talking, we're talking about? Um, and so what we argue in the book is that, I mean, democracy requires a lot. Um, and it requires a lot more than certain procedures and certain elections run, being run in certain ways. But it does require that for, for starting. You know, it, does, it is essential that you know, elections be free and fair, that opposition be given a, a legitimate chance to, to, to compete, that the, the playing field be level, that people not be locked up for their, for their points of view and for the things that they say. Um, and we hope that then democracy will lead to things like, you know, a more equal society. We hope it will lead to things like, like more transparency. We hope it will lead to less corruption. We hope it will lead to all these kinds of things, right? But it, it, but it really begins with, and it has to begin with, you just have to stop bullying your opponents, right? You just have to do, otherwise, you know, and that is really, it's a big deal, you know? It's not all of these things we want democracy to bring, but it is in and of itself a very, very big deal. You know, a place like Indonesia, the difference between 1998 and 1999 was absolutely enormous, right? And all the things we want democracy to bring about had not happened yet. But they simply stopped bullying their people, right? They simply stopped, you know, treating themselves as if they could, you know, kill people because they have the wrong political views, or you're from the wrong ethnic group, or you're the wrong, the wrong gender, or the wrong sexual orientation, or what have you, right? So, you know, these things, these things I think really, really matter. Um, I think that the reason why, so Adam Shavorsky is the one who very famously, very famous political scientist who said, you can't know it's a democracy until there's been a transfer of power, okay? That was a methodological, not a theoretical decision on his part. It's a right. coding convenience. Right. It was an argument he convinced of himself in his own head so he could make it much easier to say, mm -hmm. this, I, I know it, I can code a democracy in a quantitative data set more easily. Right. Okay. The, 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 the reality is that you do know, and believe me, people who live under a regime that has stopped repressing them do know that things have changed, right? even if 
that government does not lose power. Okay, um, so th it's a great question about the the um, democracy by mistake. So that was what I was referring to in the the, Demo the dictator's bungling part. And this is Daniel Treisman does phenomenal work on this. Um, you know, and so. What I would say is democracy by mistake is a lot like and fits really well the democracy through weakness scenario. And we never say that, that democracy more often happens in the world through strength than through weakness. We're talking about one path to the democracy. It doesn't have to be the most common one. Okay? And so it's probably true that it's more often by bungling and by mistakes. Um, but sometimes they, they, get, they calculate it correctly. And it's precisely where you are here, right? I'm going to come back to this. It's exactly the fact that you have this, you know, you have this strong track record. You have the experience of running competitive elections, right? Which are not totally free and fair, but you have a pretty good idea, right? So you don't know, you never have perfect information, right? But the ones that are higher up on the chart have better information than the ones that are lower down. So you can tell pretty readily who's more likely to make mistakes here, who's more likely to miscalculate their strength going in. Okay? So again, the history really, really matters. And for if, again, everyone here, all the new master students who are here, like if there's one lesson from all of this, I hope that you'll, you'll take to heart. Know your cases. Know your history. Learn, like, learn about a place and know where it fits. You know? get, a, get a real sense of, of a place. It's really important to know that because otherwise you just don't know. No theory is going to give you the answer unless you really understand the places that you're, that you're talking about. So democracy definitely happens by mistake. They don't go with perfect information, and this is why it's so vital that it's a reversible experiment, right? If it goes worse than you expect, you can reverse it. And that's what we see them happen, happening repeatedly. And the higher up you're on the chart, the more likely you are that you're going to say, you know what? Our confidence was not, you know, we, we, you know, was not misguided. We actually did have reason to believe we would do well. The place is not falling apart. Look at everybody voting for these conservative parties. You know, look at people not, all those scary, you know, you know, democracy activists, rabble rousers who were, you know, worrying us back in the old authoritarian days, no one's voting for them, right? If that's how it goes, right? And sometimes that is how it goes. We also make a distinction um, about signals and which signals are clearer to the regime. So give higher quality data to right. the regime, if you will. Yeah. And electoral signals are the clearest. So if, you see, yeah, so if you see your electoral is going down just a bit, right, you, you know, you, you, that means something, right? Yeah. Even if they're not perfectly free and fair, because again, it's, a, it's like a, an experiment. You look, well, five years ago we did this, and then five years ago we did this, and okay. So, and, and in places, the regimes, yeah. and the, the, one of the key points is in the regimes in which they don't, in which there aren't elections, even right. fraudulent elections or unfree and unfair elections. Multi-party elections. Um, yeah. They have the, the least uh, high quality data and is more prone to mistakes and maybe also therefore more prone to hanging on and not taking uh, that calculated risk. I mean, there was, I used to teach a course at Fuden and, um, and I had an opportunity actually to like, you know, work with Chinese students and one of, the, we had an, it was never published, but we used to have this, uh, we used to have this curve, right? And it was, it was the, it was like the, you know, the, the party is gaining power, it's at the apex of power, and then there's the bittersweet spot, and then it's, there's the hurdle through the bittersweet spot, and <laughs> now you're just an embittered authoritarian, right? And, and, you know, and our theory basically is that regimes that are just past the apex of power, just entering the bittersweet spot, are the ones that should have the most confidence in conceding. Um, and we put Taiwan there, and we also put Singapore there, right? Um, because they have pretty clear signals in terms of electoral signals. When, we were in, when I was in China teaching this course for many years, I would show that curve and I would say, just you know, to the students, it'd be like, okay, there are four points on this curve that you, you know, A, B, C, D, and E. A, parties on the rise, B, parties at the apex, C, parties in the bittersweet spot, D, party is hurtled through and it's now an embittered autocratic regime. Everyone close your eyes um, and, uh, you know, Raise your hand if you think it's A, B, C, or D. And almost every year, and I haven't been able to do this now in three or four years because I haven't been able to teach uh, this course, you saw an equal distribution across all four. Hmm. Right? Now, this is based on impressions. This is based probably on your political ideology, whatever. But it was very interesting that there was really little agreement hmm. on the strength of you know, an omnipotent political party. Um, because there were no 
electoral results to turn to. There, were, there, was, there, there, was, there was less high quality data, right. and so therefore, more likely that you'll see mistakes. Yeah. And even when your data is clear, the signals can be muddy. So a big point we make in, this, in the Britannia chapter about Singapore and Malaysia is, so they, they take some electoral bloody noses, right? From time to time they lose, but then they bounce back. And then they lose again, and so it's not really clear. And so if it's something where like, you no, know, we've lost support and we're just clearly not gaining it back, we should rethink how we're doing things. But they get these, they get these boosts. You know, which make it harder to reform. So that's again a somewhat deterministic claim we make. When when your when your when your fortunes are if your strong regime and your fortunes are rising, right? There's not much pressure on you, you know, to consider these reforms. But you're more likely. So to put it really clearly, in the next Singaporean elections, if the PAP does two percent better, they're less likely to reform. If they do two percent worse, they're more likely to. So there you go. So is it predictive? Yeah. I mean, it, I think that that's the that's at least the logic that we that we lay out. And I would say the point here is, really no, of course you don't know how you don't have perfect information about what happens under democracy. You also don't have perfect information about what happens under autocracy, right? So this whole idea like, well, of course these regimes will never reform because just keep doing what you're doing. But the world keeps changing, especially in this region, okay? And that's one reason why we wrote this book about this region, not about the whole world. Like, you cannot stay, you cannot maintain stability by standing still if you're the CCP or the PAP or the VCP in Vietnam. You have to, I mean, you are developing at such a rapid rate you have got to be adapting and adjusting. There's no status quo. So there's all this uncertainty. So again, one thing that has worked in a lot of places is you do these reforms. So, so we're going to go to the Zoom audience, I think. Who, they've been waiting patiently. They have. OK, so I have a few <laughs> Zoom questions here. Uh, Adam Casey um, is my name, not the Zoom question. OK, uh, so I'm going to ask, I'll just gonna bundle a few together. And then since I'm holding the microphone, I'm going to ask one of my own. So um, Eric White asks about some of the non-regime actors in your story, oh. so especially the strength of civil society organizations, uh, kind of what role do they play in your model, if you could speak a little bit more about that. Um, Anne Lynn would also like to know a little bit more about like, what stability means here. So how do we know, and more importantly, perhaps how do autocrats know how stable or popular they are? Uh, and then are there forms of instability they might find more threatening than others? Um, and then my question is a little bit related to Natalia's, and so, you know, what does this tell us about the limitations that come with democratization? So if democratization, you know, comes without throwing the autocrats out, you know, what did we gain from it? And also, how frequently do these autocrats who concede democracy without conceding defeat take those concessions back and rule as autocrats once defeat seems imminent? You know, how frequently don't they do that? And, uh, you know, do they lose their capacity to reverse the experiment with time? You have, the last, you have the last word. Okay, I'll just Perfect. On that question. What is the role of violence? Not only uh, repression and repression in general, but violence more in particular, both from the regime's perspective, but also from the society's perception point of view. Thank you. You have five minutes. Violence. I'm going to answer all of those questions. To answer all those questions. I can answer them all in five seconds. I don't need five minutes. No. So. Uh, so the most important role that violence plays is historically, okay? And this is a common thread in both the books that I've written, right? That your memories of, your historical experience with violence is gonna just hugely shape your perceptions of what political reform would mean. If in the olden days there was political pluralism and there was violence, then you're gonna be really worried about going back to political pluralism, right? And so that's, that again, that, again, know your history, know your cases, know what people's nightmares are, know how they think about that history. And that plays a really, really big role here. Um, the, to Adam's question about the, the limitations, I mean, there were a lot of questions bundled in your, your, your one question. Thanks, man. Um, <laughs> but I think that the, if you look at, again, that image we start with, the South Korea Philippines image, right? And you say, okay, again, kind of in our heart of hearts, we say, Philippines, that's democratization. They, they got in the streets in the hundreds of thousands of people and they chased the dictator away and he fled and you know, all of this stuff. And, you know, like, and, they, and the, 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 the little housewife who everybody voted for, like she, she was able to become president and that's what democratization really means. And South Korea is really not satisfying because like the guy was, a, he was an authoritarian general and then he wins an election. But you go 30 years in the future you know, and which democracy seems to be doing better. That's not saying countries should try to do it like South Korea does it. It's just to say, yeah, I mean, democracy, I think, is always has limitations. But it's not intrinsically more limited or necessarily more limited if it happens through strength than if it happens through weakness. Now, there's, again, along the democracy through mistake point, 
Ali Kadavar has a new book which says, if you get democracy through like mass mobilization, you get a better democracy than if you don't. And I think there are ways in which that's consistent with what we're saying because we do think these pressures matter. Um, but democracy can come out in a lot of ways and it can work in a lot of ways. I don't think we should be too, um, too restrictive on that. Um, and I think the question of like what role like NGOs play, um, I mean the sad fact is they don't get to choose, right? They're not the choosers. Right? We, we don't sideline them in the sense like we just don't think they're important. They're just not the ones who say, here's the, the trajectory the regime's going to follow. But they make a huge difference in pressuring. They make a huge difference in the votes they cast. So electoral signals and contentious signals are the clearest signals to an authoritarian regime that's past its apex of power. That's society. You don't get those clear signals unless society is delivering them. Now, one of the things that we stress is that, and again, tying it to the story of development is that you know development, um, political economic development creates more demanding citizens, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And and um, and that these citizens will demand things uh, and they will mobilize in different ways. And and, and again, wh whereas we say electoral signals are the clearest, contentious signals are the scariest for the regime, right? Big protests. Uh, big protests. And you know, in the South Korea case, I mean, it. it you do have a you do have a general who was implicated in the, you know, in the Kwangju massacre and so forth. I mean, he's, you know, by all accounts, not a a, a good person. Um, you also had five hundred thousand people in the streets in the yeah. summer of June uh, in 1987, right? This was not a bunch of elites sitting around calculating, hmm, you know, how do we how do we jerry rig these electoral districts so that we can you know that we can win a national assembly election? How likely? Is it that Kim Young Sam and Kim Dae Jung will split the vote? I mean, there there was real pressure uh, on the regime, and, and and hence the story uh, and the evidence that we share in the book of Chun Doo Hwan basically saying, like, I think we need to concede because this may be the only way to kind of save ourselves. And if we allow this opposition to really fully galvanize between the two Kims, we could really be mm -hmm. in hot water. Uh, you know, five years hence, let's do it. On the question of democratic reversal, again, I think it's, you know, it, there were, we touch on it a little bit in the book, but it, we develop it a little bit more in, um, I mean, at the end of each chapter, there is a kind of projecting outwards and sort of the, and speak to the resilience of the democratic experiment in Taiwan and Japan and so forth. And we do, you know, point out, for instance, in Taiwan, you know, the KMT, which was probably the most powerful and dominant incumbent regime, does lose elections pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, but why does the KMT not uh, slam the brakes on democracy? Because it did lose the presidency in 2000, but it doesn't lose the legislature. In fact, it actually holds control of the legislature for many, many more years. It could have really wreaked havoc. And one of the things that we point to is that, you know, is that losing is important, uh, uh, but in each of these regimes, they, didn't, they, they weren't destroyed, mm -hmm. right? They lost. But, and they lost big, but they didn't lose to the point where they were now obsolete. They knew they had a shot to compete again. And I think that's actually kind of important. They were out in the woods of the opposition for the first time, but not so far out in the woods that they didn't see a way back in uh, through democratic competition. And, and, and had the, the, the legacy of the confidence that allowed them to make the decision in the first instance that confidence actually propelled them to continue to compete. And so, you know, the LDP is still around. The conservative coalition in Korea, even though it changes its name every three or four years, is, it's basically the same party. Right. And the KMT is still around as well. So, um, you know, they've lost, they've been defeated, but they were, never, uh, they were never that far out in the woods. Okay, well, I think we are out of time, and I know that there is a reception, so that means there's food that I'm stopping you from eating right now. So I do want to um, give a round of applause for this great book, and congratulations. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.